welcome to um, the virtual space of Luxman Ireland House. I'm Dr. Miriam Nighan Gray, and I have the good fortune of being the uh, Associate Director and Director of Graduate Studies uh, here at Luxman Ireland House. We're very grateful that you're here with us this evening, and I think as I do these uh, words of introduction, people will be uh, filing in virtually into this space. Um, first of all, I can uh, let me say that I can think of no better way to spend my April Fool's Day evening and my Holy Thursday evening oh, yeah. than in the company of Peter Quinn and Lenny Sloan. Um, Luxman Ireland House, for those of you who don't already know, it's about 28 years old. And in that time, it has evolved into a veritable clearinghouse for the study of Ireland and the Irish diaspora. And it does wonderful stuff like bringing people like Peter Quinn and Lenwood, who I'll refer to as Lenny Sloan, into our orbit. Um, we're, we're, we're just thrilled that uh, Peter's novel, Banished Children of Eve, of course, that's why we're all here this evening. It was initially published in 1994. It's almost as old as Luxman Ireland House. It was published in 1994. And in 1995, it won the American Book Award. It tells the story of New York City during the third year of the Civil War, before and after the decision was made to impose the first ever military draft leading to one of the most destructive urban riots in American history. Banished Children of Eve received glowing reviews and awards on its first publication, just to quote one, the Philadelphia Inquirer, not that far from where Lenny's uh, living. Uh, he, they refer to it as um, vividly imagined, scrupulously researched and almost disorienting in its authenticity, a historical classic. When we, um, um, approached Peter a few months ago about marking this uh, wonderful occasion of the reissue of Banished Children <laughs> of Eve. Uh, he and we suggested um, pairing the conversation with Lenny. It was so wonderful to see both their reactions in terms of the esteem in which they hold uh, each other. For those of you who aren't familiar with who um, we're speaking about, Peter, of course, is a novelist. A political historian and a foremost chronicler of New York City, particularly the Irish American experience. He's the author of Looking for Jimmy in Search of Irish America and the trilogy of historical detective novels, including Hour of the Cat, The Man Who Never Returned and Dry Bones. Um, and this book, we uh, want to give a shout out for to uh, Fordham University Press. The reissue of Banished Children of Eve is published under its Empire State Editions imprint. Lenwood Sloan, as I said, I'll refer to uh, it with great affection and respect to Len, Len, Lenwood as Lenny. He's well known across the United States as a catalytic agent, animator and facilitator of cultural and heritage programs. His artistic credits include creating the the Art in the Marketplace programs for the Rouse Corporation in New Orleans, St. Louis, Boston and Baltimore. In addition, he participated on the artistic team for four national public television documentaries. For the past 30 years, he has collaborated with the renowned Mick Maloney, our colleague at Luxman Ireland House, presenting programs, concerts and masterclasses on the convergence contributions and conflicts of Black and Irish experiences in the United States. Indeed, their collaboration has taken the pair from New York to San Francisco and from Cuba to Limerick. So I'll stop talking now and without further ado, I will hand Peter over virtually and metaphorically to Lenny. Um, and after we, uh, please, Feel free to use the Q&A function to post questions. We're anxious and open uh, to hearing your questions later on in the program, which I'll come back in and moderate. Um, thank you, Peter and Lenny. And I hand over to you now, as I say, a, a, this is a, a point of personal privilege and honor for me to introduce you both here this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, this is April 1st. 
It is simultaneously Monday, Thursday, and April Fool's Day. April Fool's Day, you're supposed to do a totally foolish act. And Monday, Thursday, you are supposed to do an act of humility. It is foolish for someone to interview their own icon and their own North Star. So it's with an act of humility that I enter this conversation with Peter. The book was given to me some time ago by my dear friend and colleague, Mick Maloney, when I was traveling across country. And if you know Mick Maloney, he said, you might wanna take this along in case you get bored. Of course, the book filled my entire trip. It was sent to me in January uh, of this year to read again, as I told Peter this morning, on my second reading, the moment I got to the last page, I turned to the front of the book and started it again. I have just started reading it for my fourth time, um, uh, tracking genealogy. I need to start, Peter, with some housekeeping, just for those of us uh, who will need a base coat uh, about the book. Uh, I'd like to ask you, what was the genesis and the impetus for such an incredible Well, you know, I had studied for a doctorate in history at Fordham and wound up as a speechwriter in Albany, which is a long story. But uh, I, because I was still interested in history, I was sending away for remanded books from universities. And I sent away for a book for the University of Kentucky, uh, Adrian Cook, a study of the draft rights. And in the back, he had the list of people killed, the names that went to the morgue because people had said 1,200 people were killed. And he gave an exact listing, 128 people. I got down the list and there was Peter Quinn, 34, sh shot in the East 30s. And, I, and my family was here, but they weren't Quinns. And I said, oh my God, <laughs> is that a re am I reincarnated from this guy who was killed? And all of a sudden my imagination awoke to that situation. And what was this riot about? And why were these people fighting like that? And then, you know, I was going to write a history of the effect of the Irish famine migration on New York City. And the more I looked at it, I said, you know, my family was part of it. I really don't know anything about these people. They never made the historical record except lines of baptismal certificates. And while I was researching, I found out, I was still trying to write a history. I found out that Stephen Foster was in New York, the first great American songwriter. Before O Susanna, the biggest sale of sheet music was 5,000 sheets. He sold 100,000. And he died in New York in January, uh, 1864, after the riots, in a down and out hotel on the Bowery that's still there. And I said, you know, I'm gonna go down and stand there. And I guess every novelist at some point has psychotic experience. You're living with people who never existed. So I went down there and I, I stood there and I said, I think I know who this man was, but I can't reach him through history. So I started to write a novel. <laughs> I'd never written fiction before in my life. Uh, which if I had, I probably wouldn't attempt this, but <laughs> that started me on this journey of finding out who these people were. And if you're a historian, you can't say what they were thinking, uh, you know, when they were alone, you can't go into all the recesses that a novelist can. Novels are lies, essentially, <laughs> but they're real lies. And sometimes the lies tell more truth than history books. That is a wonderful, wonderful answer. I want to give a shout out to the Bowery Project Peter, uh, at, that did an incredible uh, uh, history graphic in the windows of uh, the new school of the place where uh, Stephen Foster lived, the theaters with, that he played in many of the scenes of the, of the book. Um, so if you're looking for graphic literature and uh, uh, iconography, you might want to look at the Bowery Project. I'm speaking to the audience now, looking at the Bowery Project, because they'll have the posters of many of the places that are located in the book. Well, you know, we celebrate Plymouth Rock and uh, Jamestown is the beginning of America. America really began on the Bowery. Yeah. <laughs> the entertainment industry get on the Bowery. The first mixing of uh, Irish white and whites and blacks was on the Bowery. Uh, there were gay bars on the Bowery. It was like a prophetic place where the true America was coming to be born, America of all sorts of varieties. So I wanna ask you about uh, 
titles as metaphors. Would you share with our guests where the title Banish of Children of Eve came from? Well, Frank McCourt once told me it was the worst title for a book. I should have thought another one. I said, you know, I think I'll call it Angela's Ashes. <laughs> <laughs> but it comes from a prayer that I said since I was a child. Uh, the Salve Regina, Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and hope to the we to cry for banished children of Eve. And it struck me, we're all banished children of Eve. You know, we're all in this valley uh, trying to find our way. We're all exiles, you know, whether for Africa or Europe or the South, uh, trying to find our way. So I said, this is a book about exiles who come to New York. Uh, even Eliza, who's an African-American who's born in Manhattan, but the group of African-Americans she's with go to uh, Staten Island to get away from the prejudice. So then she comes back to Manhattan. So everybody is there from someplace else. I want to talk about that notion of banishment and transformation, the act of uh, leaving, escaping uh, at the same time. But just a few more uh, pieces of housekeeping to sort of dig out the foundation for our conversation. How long did this process in this work take you, Peter? Uh, in total, 10 years. <laughs> the more I researched, the more I sunk into the, uh, the richness of history that you don't know. I wound up spending several months looking into indoor plumbing, what effect that had. And then uh, I just kept researching. And in August, I was in the newspaper division of the public library. My wife and child were away. <clears throat> and I finished all the newspapers for the Civil War. And I said to myself, I can do this for the rest of my life. I can research. So I put it aside and I started to write the novel. And three and a half years later, I finished. Well, you, you, you talk about that. I, I need to ask you, I'm fascinated with, would you share with us the, the various vehicles that you gathered uh, be, uh, together before you made the pattern of, of the book and the various resources that you? Yeah, well, you know, I, done, um, I never took a writing course. Uh, I read novels that I loved. Thomas Flanagan's Year of the French. Um, uh, Tom Canale's uh, Confederates, <clears throat> and a novel by a Czech novelist about New York, Dvorak and Love. And I studied those to learn how to do flashbacks, to bring complicated characters in. I would write out paragraphs from those books uh, and, and analyze them, say, what, what makes this work? Why is this sentence better than other sentences? And that was my school of fiction writing. You know, I think my feeling was if you go to schools to learn to write fiction, you're learning how somebody else writes fiction. And I wanted to write a book that I just wrote. And you know, I didn't have an agent, I didn't have a publisher, I just felt I had the story, and I had to get it out. And after three and a half years, when I finished, I said, you know, it's enough that I wrote it. I feel really relieved. And then two weeks later, I said, if I don't publish it, I'm going to have a mental breakdown. Uh, I understand. <laughs> and these characters just kept coming to me, you know, it's a uh, I don't know where they came from. I do one character and then I'd say, well, interact, you know, the thing about New York is nobody stays in their own tribe. Even if they try, we're all up against each other, subway cars, streets. Um, so when Irish people get off the boat in New York, they're not really Irish people anymore. It's like African Americans coming from the South. It's New York changes you. And, you know, I had one of these accusations by a reviewer. You generally hate reviewers who said there's no central character. And I didn't write them, but I wanted to say, you know, the central character is New York. That's what changes everybody's life. Some are crushed, some are elevated, um, some, are, you know, get rich, some get poor. It's, it's a... And this, this, this notion of the central character is one I want to uh, come to a little later because of, I, I referred to in our conversation this morning, the book like a beautiful American crazy quilt, all these pieces of cloth of different shapes and angles stitched together by story and circumstance with this beautiful overstitching. But do need to give our, our colleagues, uh, and I encourage you to uh, read the book many times because <laughs> each one is a different pathway. But 
I wanted to talk to you about time and timing in the book because it's, it is simultaneously a linear sequential story of events mm -hmm. and serial time, uh, flashback, hologram, uh, sense of concern, uh, concurrency and, and dream state, mm -hmm. dream state. So could you talk a little bit about how you, how you use time in the book? Because it'll be important for folks as they enter it. Well, you know, I was fascinated by the flashback because it seems so artificial person. And then I read William Kennedy's legs and there's a scene in there who, with a woman, Kiki, and she hides in a closet from the police. And he goes through a whole life in a flashback and it felt very natural. And I didn't want to do a straight, you know, if you do a history, you start in the beginning and go to the end. And I didn't want that. I wanted to find characters. They're introduced to you and then their, their background comes in. It's like, you know, Nugent, uh, Noonan coming into a bar and people talking about him. And uh, then he thinks and remembers and it's real history comes out. And what I tried to do was like every character is seen before they're explained. They're seen by somebody else in the book. So, you know, McCauley sees Eliza, uh, somebody sees um, Nugent and they all figure they haven't figured out. And it's a totally different history. Like Eliza is a, uh, you know, she's African-American, but to appear on the stage, she has to say she's Cuban. <laughs> and there's this great, great curiosity yes. about it because African-Americans weren't, weren't allowed on the stage. And you so, have to uh, discover for yourself that her name is not actually Eliza. Right. It comes from the role that she is playing. Right. An octoroon playing a Cuban, playing right. Eliza in Uncle Tom's cabin. Uh, right. I'll leave you to... Uh, experience her journey. Uh, you know, most of the characters in the book are making it up, making up their identities because people come to cities, they don't want to be what they were. They want to be something new. So everybody's making it up, which I don't think so, that's changed. Peter, would you talk about this notion of escaping one thing, being drawn to another, avoiding a third and uh, distracting uh, a fourth that occurs with all the characters in the book? I think they're simultaneously drawn to each other and retreating from each other. And I think it's such an interesting uh, mechanism as you advance their stories. Yeah, they all come from... Um... <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, Charles Bedford was from Lost to Make It Up, the history. And then, they, you know, Eliza and uh, Mulcahy, are both from poor backgrounds, but <clears throat> one is in Ireland and survives the famine. The other survives this um, tremendous persecution of blacks in New York. And then they come together and the differences disappear. One thing is, you know, they learn, which is the thing that overcomes everything is love. They learn to love each other. And that takes all the barriers down when, you know, it doesn't matter what race you are or who you are. When you're in love with somebody, that's all you see is that person. The other differences just kind of disappear. And again, I, I, I invite you all to discover love and circumstance with the two of them, with Jack and Eliza. Uh, and the way it's betrayed at the end, which is also part of human um, yeah. nature, betrayal. Okay, so I'm gonna use a, a, a um, New Orleans metaphor here, Peter of Gumbo, where they say, first you make a rude. So right. we've kind of made this rude that, you know, right. the structure of the story, the, uh, it's sense of time, the, uh, the concurrency of, of, of characters and then passing like ships only mm -hmm. to collide uh, together. And now I need to turn to uh, two important uh, lessons. The first is religion and, um, the book is a Bible class. Any of those of you who go to uh, Wednesday night Bible studies, you know, I, I had to get a third color pen out when I was reading it to yeah, underscore yeah. all the scriptures which you think are random but become warp and woof for the story. Uh, will you talk a little bit about how you use both organized religion 
Catholicism yeah. and Protestantism, but also Celtic belief, yeah. uh, superstition, mm -hmm. uh, dream right. states. Yeah, you know, um, one of the things is Catholics and Protestants read the same Bible, but they come to a different conclusion. So uh, there's um, the, the name Midian's Well, where the, where the uh, African American um, community retreats to on Staten Island, is a reference to Moses after he killed the Pharaoh's servant. He lives 40 years in Midian's Well. So, you know, it's uh, Moses and the, and the flight of the Israelites away from persecution. And then when John Hughes is on the top of the cathedral, he's looking west. Uh, and he's really, he's led his people. And I, I wanted to depict him as Moses on Mount Pigash. He looks to the promised land, but he's not going to get there. And the, you know, the wind, and he looks in the, in the distance of, uh, towards New Jersey and there's lightning, which is the pillar of fire, but he knows he's not going to get there. So, you know, taking those biblical references that people are, um, they're not giving the same inter interpretation to the Bible, but those are the images that they lift out and they live by. So now John Hughes, uh, our good friend, is an archbishop who right. desires to be, become a cardinal. And there's that really in, uh, important passage where he goes uh, to uh, Rome and tries to, to seek, it, uh, and he has his uh, young assistant who is sent home to both protect him and, and, and be a watchdog. Would you talk about that interesting passage and what the uh, Cardinal advises the young man about John Hughes? Well, you know, uh, Rome was very suspicious of Americans and, re and republics, and it was Lincoln who sent uh, Hughes to um, Europe to speak to the Emperor um, Napoleon III, keep them out of the war on the side of the Confederacy. Um, and Hughes, you know, was a churchman, but there wasn't much Christian about him. He was a chieftain. He was really more in common. He had more in common with an Irish chieftain than he did with a Christian clergyman. And at one point he threatened uh, 1844 with the nativist riots against Catholics. The um, nativist mayor of New York, Harper, came and said, uh, are you afraid some of your churches will be burned, burned down? And he said, if one Catholic church is burned in New York, uh, it's your churches that will burn down. Now, I, don't, I can't think of any churchman, you know, take any radical churchman, they've never threatened to burn the city down, but used it. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the draft riots, one of the things was that Wasp perceived that he controlled whatever he told the Irish they'd do. And they wanted to know why he didn't call this, the draft riot to all, because he knew he couldn't control it. He wouldn't expose his lack of power rather than the power he exerted. So, you know, he's kind of, he has a tragic ending. He's brought the people out of, he's tried to build his community. He's really the uh, originator of the Irish American community in New York. He founds uh, Fordham. He starts a Catholic school system. He talks about starting a political party. And the way he messes the, the Irish becomes the basis of Tammany Hall and all the Irish political influence in New York. I think he's one of the most important characters in the history of New York. He was also the first in your face New Yorker. He was always in somebody's face. He was in the face of the mayor of the Wasp. He was in the face of the Jesuits. He threatened to throw them out of Fordham. Um, so, you know, if you want to look for archetyp archetypal New Yorkers, uses it. Now, Peter, he, he wants to build this great cathedral and it's, it's uh, a, a, a major, not to use a pun, but building block of the story okay. about the, uh, the the lack of his ability to get Irishmen to work during the union strikes. Would you talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah, he uses, you know, his, his total obsession is building this cathedral and um, he can't believe that Irish workers would go on strike for more money to build, you know, something to the glory of God, which he's, he's bumping up against the secular world. Um, and these workers are trying to make a living and they're not gonna bow to this um, prelate. There's this incredible scene, if you'll uh, do a bit of storytelling, of him high on the rafters on a wet and rainy day, uh, kind of like if any of our, our guests tonight uh, know the tarot card, the fool standing on the precipice uh, wow. in the tarot card, and I can't help using that reference since it is all fool's day, but and his his young assistant 
literally frightened that he's going to tumble to his death. Would you, would you share that? Yeah. Uh, well, he's got a, a young assistant, Cargan, who's been sent from Rome to keep an eye on this lunatic. <laughs> And he's following you. Uh, you suddenly climbs to the top of the cathedral. He's an old man, and Cargan is walking behind him and realizes this madman's going to go to the top of the cathedral. And he's trying to find. He follows him up the scaffold, and Cargan is a little overweight. And he gets to the top. He pukes over the end of it, and then he looks at this figure of Hughes uh, with the wind that uh, wraps his cloak around him. He pulls his zucchetto, which is the or the Catholic um, yarmulke, and Cargan noticed two lumps on the back of Hughes's head, which, you know, they said Moses had horns. So he's he's like an Irish Moses. Uh, and that's, you know, important theme of the book. Uh, religion is so important to these people. This Reverend Enders who takes the black community to Midian's well, it's also a, a biblical reference. And you mentioned, you know, Celtic, Celtic uh, folk belief. Well, that was a big part of Irish belief. They were, the, the Catholic Church didn't have the same influence in 1860 they would have in 1920. Hughes wanted to organize the, the Irish around the Catholic faith. And that was a big job. Most people had this kind of folk religion, the connection, you know, the sacraments were kind of loose, the theology was kind of loose. And there's what was called a devotional revolution in Ireland, which happened when the Irish culture, most of it went away, the language, the music, and the church filled that gap. The church came in and the church was the organizing principle of the Irish in America. When I grew up in the Bronx, I knew almost nothing about Irish culture. I associated with the Catholic church. If you're Catholic, it was a good chance uh, you were Irish. And I went to parochial school from grammar school to a PhD program. In Catholic schools, I never left the Bronx. We kind of separated ourselves from, you know, we lived a separate existence from WASP society. We created a, a, a totally different community. I remember a few years ago that uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad was talking about setting up a separate school system for black kids. He said they can't learn who they are in public schools. Well, you just have the same feeling about Catholic kids. It, yeah. He set up this amazing um, school system, which was kind of crazy in a way because people paid taxes and they didn't use the schools. Not only did he create grammar schools and high schools, but he created Fordham, Manhattan College, and Mount St. Vincent, three colleges in the Bronx. You know, and, and they're, of course, all remnants of, they're all remnants of this famine immigration where they, the great principle of Irish immigration into America is reorganization. They were so totally disorganized when they came. Uh, you know, they do it through politics, unions, and the church. Uh, Peter, let's go to the others side of the spectrum with Celtic belief and the mythology. Uh, Jack is born with the veil over. <laughs> uh, will you talk about that? Yeah, the, the call, which they said the Irish thought a child born with the call, which is the inner sack of the, you know, um, womb. And some kids come out, it looks like a veil. And they think he has the gift of prophecy. And the, the old belief was they buried the call under the, under the stone going into the house. And it turns out that Jack does have the gift of prophecy. He can see when people are going to die. And that's when, you know, he, he sees when he goes to, uh, when he goes to England with these migrant workers, he doesn't go in the house with them because he sees the call on one of them and the house burns down and they're all dead. And then there's this guy Squirt, who's an African-American kid who Mulcahy adopts. And Mulcahy looks at him one night because he's in the prompter's box and he sees him he knows he's going to die. Um, so, you know, it's the kind of supernatural. I don't think it's superstition. I believe that there's a supernatural element to human existence that we don't really understand. Uh, and it plays out in different ways. And the Irish also felt, you know, Halloween is an Irish feast. Uh, they brought over. And there was a belief that on that day, the veil between the living and the dead fell. And, uh, People go back and forth. There's a great scene, it's the opening of Ironweed where the characters are going into the cemetery and all the dead are sitting on top of their tombs. And Kennedy says, even the dead live in neighborhoods, which I thought was a really good line. This is, this is uh, uh, a setting all three times, the time that the young boys are burned uh, and the time that Squirt is seen uh, 
the, the, the Jack's ability to see people's deaths. Right. And, and an incredible scene where he's looking in the mirror, mirror to see if he sees it on himself. <laughs> I, I thought was was really, really powerful. Uh, let me move from that religion and mysticism to social welfare and the plight. There are children everywhere in this story and in the most impoverished uh, uh, conditions. Sometimes you use them as humor. Sometimes they're harbingers of, of, of things to come. Uh, our uh, 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 messengers preceding. Uh, would you would you talk about the this this notion of poor Irish and black children in the streets everywhere? Well, there was a, there was a phrase "armies of the streets," and that replied to uh, uh, Irish children. Um, so many abandoned, so many um, orphans. They even formed orphan trains, which the idea was. Um, they're never gonna become Americans in the city. They're gonna stay where they are. So they had these trains that went west, which is Mulcahy is part of that, to take them and put them in you know, Protestant areas where they grow up. And one of the ironies I think of the draft riots is on the first day of the draft riots, June 13th, July 13th, the Colored Orphan Asylum on the corner of 42nd Street, uh, of 43rd Street, Fifth Avenue, you can go there today, it's an empty lot, they're gonna build something. And the first thing uh, they, the rioters do is they burn the colored orphan asylum. They have 200 orphans in that uh, who are saved by a fireman. And I said to myself, what does it take for people to hate that much? They're trying to eradicate 200 children. And they were, you know, we don't know who the rioters were, but a good portion of them were probably Irish. Uh, and most of them had come in the famine immigration. I said, what would, how in 20 years could you learn this degree of hatred that you're trying to kill? Not only lynchings in the street, but 200 children. And it struck me, you know, the original American virus is not COVID, it's racist. Uh, it affects everybody in the United States. The immigrants came in and that was the like first thing that they were infected with, which this hatred of African-Americans, it's, it's a big part of the riots. The riots are a race riot which I think I said to you this morning, race riots, don't think of groups fighting each other. Race riots are programs against African-Americans. Many times the African-Americans try to raise their head, like in Wilmington, Delaware, or um, Tulsa, there are riots to destroy them. They're not really blacks and whites fighting. Uh, and I said, what is it that leads so many people to think they have to eradicate this presence of people who have been there much longer than the immigrants? And of course, in Wilmington, it's the our Protestant masters who hired the Irish red shirts right. to burn right. out the black yeah. freemen. And that's kind of a- You know, I, I also felt, and I tried to get this in the book, Irish and uh, African-Americans have so much in common. Uh, I, I kind of call it id cultures. You know, Europeans have ego, uh, super ego cultures, museums, academies uh, that represent their culture. The Irish don't. Their culture is portable. It's music. Uh, storytelling and dance. And African-Americans don't have an official culture either. They have storytelling, music, and dance, and also the church. And these people are like mirror images of each other. And somehow they wind up killing each other and not seeing what they have in common, which is, you know, it's not the first time it ha ha happened in history that people at the bottom go after each other that rather than trying to go to people at the top. Uh, we, we've talked about the, the Irish burning down the uh, uh, Black Children's Orphan Society, but the the uh, Irish orphans in the book don't fare any better. Uh, we share two stories about Jack Dunn. The first is when Lola Montez uh, uh, arrives on Roosevelt Island, and the second is when he escapes his placement, I will say, by the uh, Christian Children's Society. Well, you know, it's the, the, the uh, orphan asylum, the city orphan asylum is on Randall Island and it's winter and these kids are in very thin clothes, but they wanna give her a welcome. So these four, force these kids out to freeze to death, giving her uh, this big welcome. And Mulcahy well, is, uh, he's eventually these orphan trains I talked about that take him out West. And instead of being in a nurturing American family, he winds up as a lot of kids did being totally exploited. They were like indentured servants. They were not um, 
being raised as you know members of anybody's family. They were just there to exploit. Uh, Which, uh, go, you know, going go back for just a minute, when 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 uh, Peter says her, he's talking about Lola Montez arriving on P.T. Barnum's barge right. because she's made a donation to the orphans on Randall Island. But they don't get to see her. They're just on the shore. They don't bring them on the boat because they don't want to be infected with anything. They're just window dressing for right. uh, a kind of, uh, yeah. if we'll all think of the, the, the mock big check presentation. Right, right, yeah. Window dressing. yeah. And then of course, that's the scene with Jack escaping um, with the uh, hurricane or tornado. Uh, yeah, yeah, out west. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, he's you know at these he he's with people who their job is how they live is collecting buffalo bones and making fertilizer out of it. It's a brutal, horrible, smelly job. And Jack feels he's going to be doing this the rest of his life, but he's rescued by a tornado that uh, he's out on this plane. Which I, I lived in Kansas City for a year as a Vista volunteer, and one of the most frightening things in the world is a tornado. Tornado, but the irony is it free, it's like some divine intervention that comes along and destroys these people who are exploiting him. And he gets out of that. And his first thought is, Let, get me back to New York. That's where I belong. And you know, I think that's a common theme in, of all the characters is New York. As I said earlier, they all look for their destiny in New York City. There was a phrase in the Middle Ages, city air makes you free. And that's with Eliza and Bedford and uh, Jack, they're all they're not so they're given another opportunity it's not that they're going to be successful some of them are not successful at all some of them meet tragic ends but there's possibilities the city is says to you you don't have to be what you were you know that that's why my own ancestors came to new york beginning in 1847 because they knew if they stayed where they were they were going to be the same forever and there was poverty and struggle to get to new york but it was promised to and, and eliza's uh journey to new york uh, by the way, good friends, you will laugh until your uh, sides ache and you will cry into your palms reading this book. There were uh, many, many times where I fought back to tears. And I, I think of two to share, uh, Peter, both are advice uh, that Eliza is given, one by a young, uh, handsome Haitian and the other by a wrinkled old uh, Fisher woman, and they're like adages for how to survive being black in America. And uh, would you would you share that? Well, one is the uh, um, Haitian says, you know, whites will put up with a black person, but if there are more than two, they get very nervous uh, and they try to dis disperse them. Um, and then you know, I actually forget what the old woman said. The old woman uh, has lost her husband, right. who was a waiter in a, uh, a, a tavern that is essential to another character. And she's also advising Eliza, don't ever be sad around white people. They right. will only <laughs> accept you being yeah. happy. And, yeah. uh, you want to navigate New York. And you know, you have to, uh, black people can't be sad, they have to live up to this image, but they uh, can't be too glad because then they're uppity. So, yes. Or, or threatening that they're laughing at white people. And in one scene when Stephen Foster is in um, St. Louis, I describe these black men on the dock and they know that um, they, they're sneering at these white people, but they have to disguise it. And the white people suspect that, that you know they're not taking them seriously um and that was so much of, of black culture subterfuge you couldn't be who you are among white people which you know it's probably still true uh you had to be in this balance of not too threatening uh but not so relaxed that you you looked you know i think of um, african-americans being stopped in, by the police in cars and african-american parents warn kids you know don't be too uppity you got to be good. You got to watch your behavior. Well, it's a very old tradition among African Americans. It's, be it's very awesome. careful of the impression you give white people. You might wind up in jail. Uh, you might wind up uh, being lynched. Um, it's like walking across a thin layer of ice. 
that might give way at any moment. I don't think, you know, being white, we have appreciation of how old that is. It wasn't hard in the South to get yourself lynched. You know, it wasn't like, hard in the North to get yourself lynched. Right. Emmett Till went into a grocery store and they thought he was looking at a white woman suspiciously and they took him out and hanged him. It's called the myth of the uh, moderate minority. Right. Uh, and it, it causes uh, uh, racial exhaustion. Right. You know, you know, was, the great comedian Bert Williams said, it is no disgrace being black, but it is damn inconvenient. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I thought of that in, uh, in, in your book. I've got one or two more questions and then we're gonna open, open to questions. I, you, you talked about Stephen Foster. You, you've taken a very uh, exotic and provocative angle on Stephen Foster's life. Uh, would you share with uh, our audience and colleagues the kind of perspective and uh, geometry of life that you come in on with Stephen Foster? Well, you know, he, he starts the mineral uh, industry really with Oh Susanna uh, and the racist songs in the beginning, but I, I came into the pressure, like he gradually moved away from that. He never used offensive words. Uh, he wrote the old Virginia, the My Virginia Bride and it's a very touching story about a slave and his, um, and the woman he separated from. And I said, you know, what, how did he make that transfer? I, I thought maybe he was one of the first white people to really listen to blacks. He was mimicking their music, but he was listening, which is, you know, whites have ever, always done, listening to black music and imitating it. Uh, and I have a scene in there where um, he's in St. Louis and he meets uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Now they were at St. Louis at the same time, but they couldn't, did they meet or not? I don't know. Well, what novelist is God? So in my book, they met and she talks to him and talks about the offensive language that he's using it against black people. And she says, you know, someday judgment is gonna come. Uh, and it makes an impression on Foster that, you know, this, these are not just people to mock, they're human beings. And then of course he meets his own tragic ending in New York uh, because he's not only the first successful songwriter, he's one of the first has-beens in America. <laughs> he rises up and then he falls. Um, and the success goes away. And that's why he winds up, uh, you know, in the Bowery um, and, and he kills himself. I have to entice the readers by uh, reading this, uh, uh, looking forward to the section of Stephen Foster and the Mad Maidens. And you'll <laughs> want to read it two or three times in a row to get the musicality of the writing out of it. Just two quick questions that I have to ask and then we'll open the uh, the question. Jack, uh, the minstrel, has a revelation about ascending from being a patty. And would you would you talk about that? Yeah, you know, he's a, he's a guy who learned uh, in Ireland. He's he's a singer and a dancer, and he comes to America, and he's following this other uh, Irish minstrel, and he realizes, you know, he's an outsider, and then he puts on blackface, mocking blacks, and then he's a white man because he joins. It's not, he says, that's what put, I put blackface on that I became a white man because, you know, I was making fun of this. So um, that changed who I was. And of course, the I African American and Irish both had this thing about singing and dancing. And Mulcahy knows he really can't go on the stage as an Irishman because he has to be a stage Irishman. So he makes the transfer to becoming a black. And people laugh and they love him. You know, he's mocking this culture by becoming a black man. It's one of the ironies, you know, there's a great scene at uh, Ma Rainey's, it's the last scene in the movie where you see the, um, you see the white people just exp expropriate black culture, jazz. It, it was taken over. You know, white people loved it and for like a long time it, they changed it into white music. So Peter, I'm at the end of the questions. You know, I have 39 more to ask, but I, <laughs> well, let's I would go. love to ask one, <laughs> one more and that is, what did you learn about yourself after you finished the book? And what new fragrances does the book draw up for you uh, now that it is re-entering our, our vernacular and our consciousness? Well, you know, I realized the complexity of history and most of us don't have really any idea what we come out of, maybe one or two generations, but we're all formed by people we don't know, we can't see. Um, 
that was, you know, we, we view history as a simple thing. And it's like history happens. Well, that had to happen. It's inevitable, the past. What I learned from that book is, no, there are several passageways to go forward, and people choose the wrong one or the right one. And I, fragrances, I don't know. That. I sweated a lot in this book, so maybe I smell like perspiration. There's, there's a lot. Of, there, there. I wanted to ask you questions about the art of spitting, which is a very yeah. vernacular thing in the book. I wanted to ask you questions about the N-word and yeah. could the book stand in the current cultural competency and correctness by removing that word, or is it so essential to the uh, the book that the N word and and Patty? Uh, I wanted to ask you about dancing around the fire as the uh, preamble to uh, Chari Vari and mobs and riots and so many. But I'll let all of those people discover their you own. Know, uh, um Glad Fordham didn't ask me to change the N word because you can't write about the 19th century and expect not to run over that word constantly. So I said, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but I can't write a realistic novel if I don't have that word. It was so common uh, to put down black people. There's no way to get away from it. It's shocking on page one and and totally understandable by page uh, by the last page. You know? oh, hey. Peter, my time has come to an end. It's time to open up the circle. We turn to Miriam and ask a question, but I, I, I thank you for such an intelligent work, such a, a gripping work. And I, I'll just share with the audience as I pass it, Miriam, anyone who knows me knows that I'm a, a peaceful man. Uh, I'm a Gandhi and I'm a, a hippie. I'm a Martin Luther King peace person. But there is one character in, in Peter's book that I couldn't wait till they murdered him. You know, he was so despicable. Yeah. Uh, if, well, if the character hadn't murdered him, I'd have entered the book and pushed him off the cliff like that. Yeah, well, I make him out. He's the, he's the first American murdered with a baseball bat. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Lenny. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's a real honor to be with you. I've respected your work so long. It's been a joy and a pleasure. And Miriam will open for questions, I think. We'll, we'll be yeah, I, I, I do so with a mixed feelings because I think a lot of us could have spent the evening listening to the two of you going back and forth on this uh, wonderful, wonderful conversation. Uh, but we do have some questions coming uh, in here that we'd like to get to. And just remember, folks, we have uh, shared the link to the Fordham Press, and there's a discount if um, uh, if anyone's interested in picking up the book. But let me, um, I'll start here towards the end. There's a question in from Charles Hale. Um, Hello, Peter. Recently, I was speaking with a friend about some of the great con artists in New York City history. Speaking of which, I think Fernando Wood may have been out of office in the third year of the Civil War but I'm sure he had an impact on the Bowery Five Points neighborhoods. Any other con artists in the, that neighborhood at the time? I think there might have been one or two. Do you have anything to yeah. say back to well, Charles on that? The Peter? city, uh, the same as today, is filled with con artists. <laughs> a lot of work on Wall Street. Charles Bedford is a, a con artist. Fernando Wood is a con artist. Jay Gould, who appears in it, was a great financier and a con artist. But that's another great New York skill. Uh, how many, you know, you think of all the con artists on Wall Street who have gone to uh, jail. It's a great New York tradition. And, you know, they're going to be endless. It's not going to end now. You look at 2008 with all the con artists, um, Lehman Brothers, none of them went to jail because rich people, you steal a television set, you go to jail. <laughs> you steal $8 million or $10 million, they reach a settlement. Um, um, how did you deal, Peter, with the historical critiques since there was such a strong scaffold of fact upon which your fiction hangs? That's in from Martin Nutty. That's a great one. Uh, I tried to be tr true, as I said earlier, to the record when the facts were there. I tried to be true to the facts. I changed names and things, but most of the time in history, the facts aren't there, especially if you're dealing with the characters. A, a 19th century Black woman in New York, where do you, where's the record? Where's her voice? Um, 
Mulcahy wears his voice. I was aware of this because, you know, I don't know the voices of my ancestors. Um, I know they came in the first in the 1840s. I don't have a, I don't have rosary beads. I don't have no picture. And I said, you know, I have to find their voices. And the only way I can do that is from my own imagination. And how many, you know, you look in your own families, what's on the record about? How many, how many voices do you have of your own ancestors? You don't, because 99% of human history is not on the record. And the people who get on the record are usually wealthy, uh, high-born politicians. Um, you know, you look at biographies there of, it's, it's a celebrity heaven. But who are these other people lists? Who was the person who served Lincoln's dinner? Um, that's what always interests me is, and only the novelist can reach those people because the novelist can be a liar and the historian has to stick to the facts. So I'm much more comfortable being a liar than a historian. <laughs> and I think, you know, the funny thing about lies is a lot of time they're true. Um, Peter, as part of the editing process, um, did you have to abandon any characters or um, have you any regrets in terms of any edits that you had to make? I mean, it, it ended yeah. up being a long book and it's, it's so rich because of that. Yeah. But did tell us a little bit about anything you had to cut that is memorable. Well, when I uh, finished the book, it was 800 pages. <laughs> and I had a friend of mine, uh, Bob Cranny, was a novelist. I gave it to him. He said, I'm not going to read it. <laughs> no agent's going to read. Gotta cut. I cut 200 pages out. Uh, and it was a better book for that. And there was one character, Elma Ellsworth, who was the first uh, officer killed in the Civil War. He was very interesting. And I had him have a homosexual affair with Stephen Forster. I spent about two months writing this. And then at the end of that, I said, you know, I had to know this, but the reader doesn't have to know this. So but I it's a provocative, uh, yeah. uh, it's a provocative weaving of that thought then. Right. Yeah. I, I thought, yeah. um, you know, I'm laying it on too heavy. <laughs> But your fingers get steamy when you turn the page in that right, section. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you have yeah, to, you I know, mean, Hemingway always said that you have to, as a writer, you have to be willing to kill your babies. And, yeah. you know, you spend a lot of time on characters and then the more you write about them, you realize, uh, you know, I knew this, but the reader doesn't. And I, and I have to be fair to the reader. I'm not there to entertain myself. I'm there to tell a story and make it as interesting. And, you know, 600 pages, you have to do a lot to bring the reader with you. Um, it's not like my, my college roommate at uh, Manhattan College was James Patterson. <laughs> so, you know, chapters more than three pages. So I have, I don't know, 150 page chapters. There's a quartet of clowns, Cassidy, McSweeney, Flanagan, and Cunningham, right. who are well worth following in their antics across the book. Yeah, they come all across the book. You know, another thing was, uh, one of the themes in the book is Stephen Foster's music. It's everywhere. Um, people don't even know what they're singing or singing his songs because again, he's permeated the, uh, he's the first musician to put his music in the throats of people from California to New York. And he, you know, he does that because the first internet, the internet didn't start um, a few years ago. The telegraph was the internet. It united people all across the country instantaneously. This is nothing. People say, oh, the internet, you know, creating the modern future. Well, it happened about 150 years ago. Peter, I have a question in from Mike Tub Michael Tuberty. Irish immigrants were in effect reinventing themselves in the United States, mm -hmm. but the novel also features a native born character who reinvents himself right. by assuming a new identity. How common was that during the Civil War era? Um, well, that's another thing you have to use your imagination because a lot of people successfully reinvented themselves. Um, but we don't, like Jay Gould I was talking about, he was a a kid from upstate, um, uh, Rockefeller, they were like Protestant kids from upstate and they came to New York and reinvented themselves. I think, you know, Wall Street has been filled with people who reinvent themselves. The entertainment is, industry is all about people who reinvent themselves. F. Scott Fitzgerald once said, there are no second acts in America. I think that um, that's all there are in America, second acts. <laughs> Everybody's trying to have a second hand. You're born one way and you don't want to stay that way. You want to come something else. That's the genius of America. You're in more established societies. You are what you were born. And here you can be something else. You can even, if your movie starts changing your name, nobody finds that um, difficult. I worked for Time Warner. I worked for Steve Russ. And uh, he was a big mogul. And 
he uh, his um, his uh, curriculum vitae was filled with lies. <laughs> and somebody at time wanted to say, "Well, he's the worst. He made up these things." I said, "Well, he's from Brooklyn, and uh, he wants to become a new person. So, what the hell? He can be whoever he wants. I don't care what he put on his resume. <laughs> Why would I care? You know, if he's good at what he does." It was like hiring other speech writers. People would say, you know, he went to Yale or Harvard. I said, I don't really care. Let me see a speech. Mm -hmm. You know, you are what you create, not their um, pedigree. I'm a person without a pedigree, so I understand it. Peter, there's a question here about why um, Archbishop Hughes, um, uh, can you speak about why the Bronx became the neighborhood for colleges established by Hughes in our Irish and New York City class? We talk mostly about the Irish living in the uh, Lower East Side. So I'm curious about what made the Bronx, you know, attractive. That's part of that upward movement of people out of the city into better conditions, right? Well, the Bronx was the Wild West or the Wild North. It wasn't part of New York City. It wasn't part of New York City in 1914. And people moved up there because the air was salubrious. Um, Hughes put the university because it was a seminary and they didn't want the seminarians near the city. Um, and he put the, the orphan asylum up there because he didn't want these kids in the city. So, you know, ironically, the Bronx became this one of the first suburbs. And then the way things changed, it became a, a synonym for urban ruin when I was growing up. Um, which is the other thing, you know, not only pe do people not stay the same in New York, but entire areas of the city don't stay the same. Uh, I think, you know, the dynamism of New York is that acceptability and kind of inevitability of change. Mm -hmm. Other places in the world, you know, are established. Amer we're still making it up in America. We're still making it up in New York. If you look at French culture or British culture, or German, they have official academies. There's an official culture. We really don't have an official culture, which is, you know, one of the great strengths of America, which is why it has such influence in the world, because the culture is so plastic. Miriam, I was, I, I was going to ask Peter if, if I could sneak one in between your next question. <laughs> if, if you'll speak about no rest even after you're dead uh, and uh, uh, the cemetery, the African cemetery, the cemetery of the uh, industrialist uh, department store guy and St. Anne, so many of your, your colleagues, and those cemeteries in the Bronx. Yeah, well, you know, the first, um, one of the first cemeteries in Manhattan was the, um, the, the colored cemetery down on Foley Square, very large. It was slaves born there. Um, and then when A.T. Stewart wanted to build his department store, he built it on top of that. He bought the land. So it was the obliteration of uh, not only um, a cemetery, but a black memory. It was only discovered 20 years ago. And then at the end of the book, when Eliza's, she's got a church and she's up near Albany and it's a community of uh, black uh, believers. And then 30 years after they kind of disappear, uh, the cemetery is there. And the county officials decide, well, they're not here anymore. So we're gonna build a shopping center. We'll just remove the bodies. And you know, that went on all the time in the South, slave cemeteries, they only got wooden, tombstones and part of uh, you know African American experience was having the past obliterated. The, the disrespect for the past of African American um, is such a part of American tradition. You know, the whole thing like lynching, they were like lynching a week in the South in the 1880s and then nobody had any memory of it. It was the only recently that people have kind of gone back to that. Um, so, you know, I think that's one of the things, the constant disrespect and obliteration of African-American history. We're still and, people and, just and, coming to terms with African-American history, you know, 150 years of the Civil War, people are asking themselves, I said, why didn't they ask themselves this question 150 years ago? How can I make Stewart's, it? Stewart's grave with, uh, yeah. and uh, uh, his own plight. Uh, and, yeah. uh, <laughs> he, he built a cathedral in Garden City, he founded Garden City and he uh, had a big tomb for himself and, that were body snatchers who took his body and held it for a ransom. I said, this is the revenge of history on the guy who obliterated the black cemetery. He wasn't allowed to rest in peace either. <laughs> you know, um, it was a delicious revenge. 
I'm conscious that we're coming up towards the end of time and um, I'm sorry, we're not going to get to all the comments and questions that came in. Um, I will save them and send them along to um, Peter afterwards. Can I just ask you, Peter, as um, uh, seen as I have the mic here, um, you know, in a way like Banished Children of Eve is kind of you excavating the journey of your family, your ancestors um, from Ireland to the United States and on some levels. Was your, were your parents around to see this or read it or anything? Yes. Uh, my mother was uh, the only one alive. She was 88. She was a college educated woman. And uh, I sent a book to her. I didn't hear from her. My sister said, you better call her. <laughs> So I called her and she said, you know, it's kind of disappointing to get to my age and realize you have a son with a pornographic imagination. What are, what are my friends gonna think? She said, I said, well, you only have three left and Rosemary's blind, so I wouldn't worry about it. But she was not happy with this at all. Oh, really? No, no she didn't want any, any excavations. She said to me at one point, you know, that's baggage. If you lost relatives, you lost them for a reason. And my father died. She took all these records that he had and threw them out. She was, you know, you're in America. You're here to be something, something else. This is not, there's a lot of unpleasant history here that we don't need to carry with us. Wow. I mean, she was, you know, a delightful woman, but she had no use for history. She was a Stalinist when it came to it. Wow. Get rid yeah. of her. The notion of transformation in the book, good and bad, wrong and right, right. Uh, evil and benevolent, uh, rings of tonight's news, Peter, you know? And uh, I, I, I told Peter this morning, Miriam, that the first time you sent me the book was January 6th. And I was reading the book and uh, watching the insurrection at the same time. And I was like, this is jumping off the page. So the, the currency of it, it's a lens for tonight's news. You know, I made my uh, my family very unhappy with the book. I had an aunt who said, you know, we never knew Irish people like this. <laughs> I said, we didn't know them, but we come from them. <laughs> well, listen, um, Lenny and, and Peter, uh, and Peter, congratulations um, on the reissue of Banished Children of Eve. I, the reaction of people when they've heard that it's... Uh, back in print and available again in this way. Well, I, I'm sorry, maybe it wasn't out of print, but that there's a new issue of it and that we it affords us opportunities to have these rich conversations. Um, I've taken so much pleasure in seeing uh, and listening to you and uh, Lenny this evening. And thank you both for uh, coming on um, this, uh, on the, on the you know, beginning or, well, the, the near the Easter celebration for anyone celebrating it. Um, uh, enjoy it and be safe. And uh, please sign up for uh, our events if you don't already know about Duxman Ireland House. We've shared the link uh, to Fordham University Press and to their discount code there in the chat. Peter, did you want to say something? One last thing. Today is Monday, Thursday, when traditionally um, the priest washes the feet of parishioners. I feel like washing Lenny's feet. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh I, I have such admiration for him. You know, the way he reads books, his um, skill as an artist. When you said he was going to be here tonight, I was like, well, you might ask him, but I don't think he'll want to come. <laughs> so, it, Lenny, it thank, a, you, thank you so much. I can't thank it you was enough. a joy and a revelation. Thank you all very, very much. And, My only sorrow is it's over. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have, we'll, we'll talk for years. We'll settle a lot of things. Okay. Thank thanks you all. all. Thanks, Miriam. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah. Thanks very much, everyone, and see you all again soon. Bye bye. Bye bye.